Shalom, Israel. Ah, welcome to Prophecy Christian Ministries. I'm excited. What does it say on the screen? Which team are you on? It sounds like a sounds like a trick question. Sounds like a trick question. Disciples versus Christians, which team are you on? Let's start off with the scripture. I want to show you guys something very interesting. Bring the beat down just a touch and give me Job chapter 36. And we're going to be starting at verse 10. It says, He openeth also their ear to what? He openeth their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. This word return in the Hebrew is the is a, it's a verb. It means shub. Shub. It means to physically turn. This is also the same word that is used for repent. So he openeth their ear to what? Opinion? No. To discipline. And commandeth that they repent, return from iniquity. Today we're going to be talking about discipline, but in the course of that, we're going to take a look at the difference between a disciple and a Christian because discipline is a process of being instructed, corrected, and punished. Sometimes we skip over stuff like with our kids and we just jump right to punishing them, right? It's not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to give them instruction and then when they don't follow the instruction, you don't get to jump over to spanking. You give them Oh, y'all know about this. You give them correction. And then when they completely disobey what you've said, then you give them punishment. Why are you doing that? So that they will have fear, that they will know that you ain't playing games. God does it the same way because he's a good, good father. All right, so watch this. Is God angry with you when he punishes you? Is he angry with you? No. He's not. Watch. Let's let's take a look. Give me Proverbs chapter three. Let's take a look at verse eleven. Proverbs chapter three, verse eleven. The Bible says, "My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord." What does chastening mean? The correction, the correction and the punishment. Right? The instruction, the correction and the punishment. All of that is the chastening. That's like you getting tightened up. Right? <laughs> He's tightening you up because you was. Off the path, it says, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be wary of his correction. And then, and then the scripture tells you why. Give me the next verse. Verse 12. For whom the Lord loveth, what does he do? If the Lord loves you, he's going to correct you. Now, we had a very deep Bible study yesterday, and it explained what love is and what hatred is. See, if you see somebody committing a sin worthy of death and you don't correct them, that ain't love, that's hate. You hate them. You see them going completely off and you're like, man, if God was here, he would strike you down right now. <laughs> but I'm just gonna let you keep doing what you're doing. You hate them when you do that. But the scripture says, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So correction is an action of love we correct our children because we love them the scripture says for whom the lord loveth he correcteth even as a father the son in whom he delighted all right now watch this he repeats himself and this is a excellent example of how the precepts work in the scriptures because timothy as he is writing the book of hebrews he remembers what is said in the book of proverbs I mentioned that Timothy wrote the book of Hebrews. Most people don't know that because their Bibles don't say that. But if you have an old Bible, an old King James Bible, like a King James 1611, the very last verse in the book of Hebrews tells you that Timothy wrote the book of Hebrews to Italy. Okay, so don't let nobody tell you Paul wrote it or James wrote it or we don't know who wrote it. If you get an old enough Bible, it will tell you who wrote it. Now watch this. In order for Timothy to teach this lesson, he doesn't make up his own words regarding discipline. He draws back to the scriptures. Give me Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. 
The Bible says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. None of y'all in here are children, but everybody in here is a child. Ain't that right? That's weird, right? Pastor, that sounds like a contra contraband. It sounds like contraband. No, it's not, it sounds like a contradiction. Why is that? Nobody in here is a you guys are not children. Our children are, are in that room. But everybody here is a child of God. And everybody here has a mother and a father and a father in heaven. But you have forgotten the exhortation. That's the warning. Which speaketh unto you as unto children. And then look what he does. He says, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. See, when God cor corrects you, don't be like, oh, I'm giving up. I can't do it. <laughs> That's what the first thing we want to do. We're like, oh, you corrected me? Well, I'm just going to go completely off now. Son, what are you doing? Why are you despising the correction? Give me the next verse, verse 6. It says, for whom the Lord loveth, what does he do? He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You know what a scourge is? Man, that's a powerful one right there. I, there's a story in the Bible about Jesus, and it's the time of the Passover, and he walks up in the temple, and he's like, hey, uh, what's that cattle doing in here? And you you, you selling in here on the whole? Let me get some. Okay, and he starts braiding up some cords. I'm like, yeah, I got some for you. And he's braiding it up, and he made a scourge. What is that? What is that? He whipped them out of the temple. They got a whooping. <laughs> you got a whooping from Jesus? Was he doing that because he was mad? No, that's correction. Yeah, if you keep doing that, you're going to get destroyed. So don't despise the whooping that you get from God. Neither should your children despise when you correct them, but it all depends on what attitude you're correcting them in. If you're demonstrating anger and taking out your frustrations on them, well, then that's, that's not how God does it. God doesn't take out his frustration on us. He instructs us. He corrects us. And then if we continue to do it, then he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Where in the Bible did Jesus teach people how to raise people from the dead? Anybody know that verse? You're looking around like that's in second opinions. Verse. No. Oh, where, where did he teach people how to walk on water? Take, put one foot. No, that verse not in there. That's in second assumptions. Yeah, that's not in there. Okay. Um, do you know that, do you know why Jesus didn't teach you how to raise people from the dead or how to heal the sick using a scientific formula, how to walk on water? Because without faith, it's impossible. You can't do it. So what did he teach you? How to have faith. So he taught you the root so that you could use that faith to do whatever you want to do. If all I taught you how to do was walk on water, you'd be able to do a really good trick. You'd probably be like David Blaine. But if I taught you how to have faith, you would be able to reach people around the world and demonstrate your faith. So Jesus is like, instead of teaching you how to heal the sick, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Instead of teaching you how to not have fear, I'm going to teach you how to love. Because what does love do? Love casts out, right? Perfect love casts out fear. Instead of calling you Christians, uh-oh, which team are you on? Instead of calling you Christians, I'm going to call you my disciples. Why is that? Because you were receiving the discipline from the master. I, you guys are not getting it. Show them the slide real quick. I created a slide so that you guys can understand how this process goes. Take a look. Now, this dude, his steps... He got long legs. I don't, I don't know how he's doing it. Are you skipping all the steps that make you grow as a disciple? First, you become a disciple. And after you have learned the discipline and you can use these things and you follow Christ and you walk like Christ, then they're going to call you Christians. It doesn't say that the Christians were called disciples. It says that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. I want to talk for a minute about discipline versus disappointment. Think about that. Anybody here ever been disappointed? Yeah. When your life lacks discipline, it is full of disappointment. 
When you don't do the thing that you are supposed to do, that you were called to do, that you know God, God has opened up this door and moved everything out of the way so that you can have this thing. And he says, I want you to do this one thing. And you don't do that one thing. What's at the end of the journey? Disappointment. That means you planned something, but you didn't follow through. A life without discipline is a life of disappointment. Okay, watch this. Let's get that gym membership. <laughs> you know what I'm we got to get buff. Let's get, man, if I give me a gym membership, best gym in the world. I got Dwayne The Rock Johnson as my trailer. He's training me. Boom, he's putting the weight. We lifting it. And I'm like, man, I'm sore today. That was good yesterday. I did real good. I was there yesterday, but I'm not going today. And then because I didn't go today, you know what? I'm not going to go tomorrow. I'm getting a little tired. And a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years later, have I exercised discipline? Nope. So what does is, what is my fitness goal become? A disappointment. It works that way in everything in life. How many times is the word disciple found in the Bible? Think about that. No, nobody knows. How many times is the word Christian found in the Bible? Somebody ought to know that, would you say? Exactly three times. The word disciple is found 272 times in the King James Bible. Yeah. Jesus, what did he call his followers? Did he say, you are going to be my Christians? No, he said, you're going to be disciples okay um who started calling them christians because we know jesus called them disciples but who started calling them christians we don't know the world did we don't know the scripture watch let me show you the scripture real quick give me acts chapter 11 verse 26 pull that one for me acts chapter 11 verse 26 A guy is looking for Paul. He finds Paul. Let's just read it. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the, what are they? Okay, they actually are disciples. Were called, what were they called? See, there's a difference between what you are and what you're called. Yeah. You have to be able to prove what you actually are. I can call you an airplane pilot, but I'm not putting you in the cockpit. Does that make sense? That's real dangerous. I'm in. I call you a lawyer, but you don't know law. You just called by. Okay. And the disciples were called Christians first. And anti the Bible doesn't tell you who called them that, but I want to point out something to you. This word was always used in all three of its mentions in the Bible in a derogatory format. So let's take a look. Give me 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. The Bible says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For whose name? You got reproached. People are speaking against you for the name of Christ. You should be happy. It says, For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Now, I want you to see the structure of these words. Verse 15, he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Is that a positive term if I called you a murderer? No, that's derogatory. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. What about that? If I called you a thief? No? Am I lifting you up or pulling you down? Okay, that sounds derogatory. Or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Are any of those positive? No. Okay, then let's keep going. Let's keep this in context. Give me the next verse. Yet if any man suffer as a... Huh. Wait, is he using that in the positive context? No, he's not. He's saying if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, then you are happy. Right? Happy are ye. But don't suffer as any of these things. But if you suffer, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. Now, this is what's weird. I don't know why we do this. Uh, was, it, was he Jesus, Jesus Christ? 
Was it Jesus Christ? It was Jesus Christ. But why do we call ourselves Christians instead of Christians? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. Um, so the word disciple is in the Bible 272 times, and there is only one mention of disciple in the Old Testament. You know where it is? It's one of my favorite verses. It's the key to unlocking the difference between a Christian and a disciple. Because anybody can say that they are a Christian and learn Christianese. You guys know what Christianese is, right? That's when you, you hang out in the church or you're around your Christian friends. Amen, brother. Praise the Lord. All of those things, that's Christianese. That's the language that you speak. But when you're a disciple of Christ, men are going to know that you're a disciple by one thing, and it's not the language that you speak. It's the, it's the love that you have one toward another. So you can't fake that love, but you can fake being a Christian. You can, man, my suit looked good. I learned the language really good, but I don't live this thing out. Okay, let's take a look at this one mention of disciple. I like this one. Give me Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, because he tells you the key to being a disciple. He says, bind up the testimony. <laughs> what The testimony of who? Jesus, okay. And seal the law. What law? The law of sacrifice? Absolutely not. What law is he talking about? The law of God. Okay, so he says, you got to have two things. You got to mix these two things together. You got to have the testimony of Jesus and you got to seal the law among who? This is the only mention of the word disciples in the Old Testament. Now, I encourage you to go back and read this because this whole chapter is talking about Christ and he's giving some instruction. Now, jump down to verse 20 so that you can see what happens once you have bound the testimony. Where are you binding that up? In your mind and in your heart. And you have sealed the law. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. There's something that the disciples are supposed to have. It says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, why is that? Because there is no light in them. Okay. That's the very first mention of the word disciple in the Bible. And he says, they need to have the testimony and they need to have the law. Okay, now let's go to the very next mention of disciple. And I want to show you something you may not have seen. Because to rightly divide the word is a gift from God. Give me Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Jesus did his baptism thing. He was fasting. He was hungry. He did the temptation thing. And he's like, whew, it's time for me to speak to these people. I want you to see what the scripture says. And seeing the multitudes, who did he see? He saw the multitudes. He went up into a mountain. Where did he go? And when he was set, who came? His disciples came unto him. What did Jesus see? The multitude, a gang of people. Where was he at? He was in a mountain. Who came to him? It doesn't say that the multitudes came to him. His disciples came unto him. Watch the very next verse. And he opened his mouth and taught. Who did he teach? His disciples. Those are the ones that came unto him. Everybody else. You guys know everybody who was following Christ did not end up being a disciple. You guys know that, right? Some people were hungry and it's like, dude got mad good chicken sandwiches. If I just follow him, he's going to break some fish and some bread and I know he's going to feed me. See, some people were just following because of what they could get. Other people were following because of who they are. Some people nowadays in our modern Christianity are unfortunately are just following because of what they can get. But then there's some of us that are following because of who he is in us. Does that make sense? It's an identity issue that we're dealing with. Okay, he opened his mouth and taught them saying, now, you guys are familiar with Matthew chapter 5. What is this, what is this selection of scripture called? The Sermon on the Mount. And it's also called the Beatitudes. The Attitudes... If you want to be a disciple. No, seriously, I want you to see. Watch this. We're not going to read the whole thing. I just want you to see. Let's just take a look at verse 3. Let's see what he says. You got to see the structure of what's being written here. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? Someplace in outer space. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Where's the kingdom of heaven located at? On the earth. Okay, let's just jump down. We're not going to get into that. Give me verse 9. Because he's, man, the first thing he did, he said, 
your identity is blessed. I don't care what you've been going through. Your identity is blessed. Watch. Give me verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. He's, dude is handing out blessings. He's like, boom, boom. You got to imagine that you're there. Like he's sitting there and the disciples are sitting there and there's a big old mass of people. But he's talking to his disciples. And he says, blessed are you. You be making peace. Two people be arguing and you figure out a way to calm it down. You're going to be called the children of God, All right? Jump, jump to verse 13. I want you to see. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? What is the it in that sentence? Wherewith shall the earth be salted? Now, we know salt is a preservative. So if you are the salt of the earth and you lose your, your saltiness, how is the earth going to be preserved it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men okay he handed out some blessings right foo, foo. and now he starts handing out identity and assignments what did he say that you were you're the salt okay watch give me the next verse he's he's giving you your identity from the very first time that he began to speak he started handing out the attitudes that go with the disciples he says, you are the light of the world. Wait, didn't we read a scripture that says, if they don't speak about the, and the, then there is no. Okay, so this is a problem right here. Because that scripture was related to being a disciple. He said, seal the law among my, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. To the law and to the testimony, if they, who's the they? My disciples. If they speak not according to this word, then there is no light in them. And then when he finally gets all of his disciples together, he says, uh, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. All right, I want you to see something real quick. First, he informs them that the decisions that they make come with blessings. If you decide that you're going to be a peacemaker instead of somebody who wants to argue with everybody, man, you're going to be called the children of God. If you decide to be this, you don't have to be what you are. You can make a decision to follow Christ. That's what he said. And he handed out blessings. Boom. And then the very next thing, when you have time, go back and read the Beatitudes and take a big overview of what it is. Because he's handing out blessings. And then he says, well, wait a minute. Your identity is kind of suspect. Um, so let me give you an identity. You are the salt and you are the light. And then in the very next section... He tells them not to even let this thought cross their mind. <laughs> what is the thought? He says, don't, I don't want you to think for any reason. Give me Matthew, give, jump to verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. What law? Is he talking about the law of sacrifice? Nope, because he destroyed the law of sacrifice. We all agree, right? He destroyed that. Did he destroy the law of God? No, he did He said, don't even think that. Why would you think? Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Give me the next verse. I want you to see what he's saying here in the context. Verily, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Is that a specific time? Is that a specific thing that you're going to be able to see? Yes, it is. It is. We find in the book of Revelation that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth, what happened? They passed away. He says, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So he told them, you're, blessing, you're blessed if you make this decision. If you think this way and you make this decision, then you're blessed. And you have an identity that comes with blessings. Your identity is a disciple. You're salt. You're going to preserve the earth. And you were light. You're going to shine in the darkness. <laughs> okay. But it's not even the, the light doesn't come out of you. You're literally just a reflection. You are reflecting his light. And then he, he stops and he says, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't even want none of y'all to think that I came to destroy the law. Okay. Now let's keep going. Watch this. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break how many one 
Whosoever therefore shall break one of these important commandments, great commandments, ten commandments, nope, one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. You guys know what that means. Everybody in here knows what that means. The lake of fire is located where? In the kingdom of heaven. Don't be tricked into thinking the lake of fire is somewhere else. It's on the outside of the gate, but it's in the kingdom of heaven. That's the reason why you're called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now watch this. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What instruction did I just get from Jesus right there? If I'm a disciple and I was sitting there and I heard him saying that out of his own mouth, he just gave me some instruction. He gave me some blessings. He gave me some identity. He told me something that I'm not even supposed to think about. And then he gave me some instruction right there. He said, I'm supposed to do them and I'm supposed to teach them. Now, this is the very first message of Jesus. Are you guys aware that Jesus Christ is the same Guess what the last message Jesus gave was? Go ye therefore into all the world, baptize them, teach them, right? It's the same message. He's the same. Okay, now watch this. So his first message and his last message were exactly the same. He gave his last message after he resurrected from the dead, after he was already the perfect sacrifice. But he can't change his message. You still have to go out there and teach these people. Now watch what he does next. Verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Who were the scribes and the Pharisees at this time? Religious leaders. If you, <clears throat> to put this into perspective, every man didn't have a Bible like we do now. You can just go to Walmart and be like, give me three of those. It wasn't like that. This, this thing was hand copied. Right. We when we read in the Old Testament, when a king would take the throne, he had to write the entire book of the law. That's the only way you get to be king. You can't rule over people and you don't know no rules. How are you going to judge people and you ain't read the law? They had to hand write their own copy. OK, now at this time and, and let me also put this into perspective. This is the time of Jesus. There is no New Testament. Every single scripture in the Bible that uses the word scripture is only referring to the Old Testament. There was no New Testament written at that time. Okay, so the scribes and the Pharisees, oh man, they got a copy of the law. But they're not going to tell you what the law says. They're going to tell you what they think it says. And he says, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Well, they have the law, and they spend all day reading the law, but do they do the law? No. So except your righteousness, right choiceness, remember this is about choices, the things that you choose to do, except your right choiceness shall exceed the right choiceness. See, because they had the law and they chose not to do it. They chose to interpret it their own way instead of the way that God said. You shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he spends the remainder of chapter 5, every verse in chapter 6, and every single verse in chapter 7, and he instructs them how to be disciples. Let me just give you a brief overview. He teaches them how to understand the scriptures. He said, it hath been said, you guys are familiar with those verses, right? That's where he's teaching them how to understand the scriptures. He says, uh, he teaches them how to pray, but when ye pray, be not like the heathen. He teaches them to say what they mean and mean what they say. These are good traits for a disciple to have, isn't it? Man, you pray for people. You have integrity. He teaches them how to love their neighbor, right? Bless your enemies. You guys are familiar with these verses. He teaches them how to fast, right? He teaches them how to seek the kingdom before they seek anything else. These are instructions for disciples. If you don't know this, why are you calling yourself a disciple? And if you're not a disciple... Why are you running around here calling yourself a Christian? You don't get to skip over the discipleship step all the way over here. Boom. You don't get to do that. Right? Man, I'm, 
I raised my hands and I repeated after somebody, and guess what I am now? <laughs> no, no, you missed a step. Get some teaching of Jesus in your life. Learn how to love people because you can leave from here. You can raise your hands. I can dip you in the water. I can baptize you. But if you don't know how to love people, they're not going to know that you. What are you? You're still the same old man. You're still in the flesh. The first thing that Jesus did in his public ministry was not say, repeat after me and become a Christian. He said, walk how I walk. Now, this is what this word Christian means. It means to follow Christ, to be like Christ. How can you be like Christ if you don't know what he was like? How can you do what he did if you don't know what he did? That sounds like bars right there. Man. Okay. And he specifically told them that there is one thing. He's talking to the disciples. Watch this. He specifically told them that there is only one thing that I don't want you to think, and that is the very first thing that Christians are taught to think. You don't have to keep those commandments. You don't have to keep that law. You can do whatever you want to do. That's what they're taught. So, what team are you on? Disciples or Christians? Because it's, it's a negative term nowadays, unfortunately. Instead of Christian being associated with love, it's now associated with hypocrisy. You know how that's going to change? The world's not going to change the way they see you. You have to change the way they see you. You have to be a demonstration of the love of Christ, whether it's in this building, it's in your car, it's at home, it's on your job, when you're in school, wherever you are, that's what you have to be. That's the only way this thing works. You guys remember one last thing I want to share with you. Remember? Um, and many shall say unto him in that day, who do you think that many is? Disciples? Ah, man. We know it's not non-believers because what do they do? Lord, Lord, have we not? And then they list off their resume. <laughs> man, you know what I'm saying? I planted a church in Phoenix and I rapped on mad stages and whew, I sold mad records, Lord. And he's like, um, Who was your name again? <laughs> well, I don't know you. Okay, but then he's, as he's talking to his disciples, he says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. What is that one thing? Love, that you love one another. That's the most important thing. That's what we got to get in our life. When we are our brother's keeper, it's because we love them. When you keep the commandments, when you come to my house and you don't steal from my house, it's because you love me and you love God. The keeping of the commandments demonstrates that we love God and we love his people. Amen? Well, this is the message that I have for you today.